uh, to begin, I, my background, my parents are both musicians and they both had classical training. So um, when I, growing up, I was listening to classical music much more so than, like, say, guitar music. And so I, I, I knew guitar music because my father was a guitarist, but my, my general idea of what classical guitar was, a relation between the guitar that I knew and the composers that I was familiar with. And at the time, uh, one of my favorite pieces was uh, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony and um, then Korsakov's uh, Scheherazade. And, you know, it, these were very dear, this was very dear music to me. And as I started my studies, I came across, um, you know, the arrangement of uh, Kasuito Yamashita's um, of, um, uh, well, you know, pictures and exhibition first, then uh, Dvorak's New World Symphony, which I also knew, and then, say, Stravinsky's Firebird, um, etc. So, you know, with the, with pictures, um, my objective was, as a guitarist, I wanted to see if I could overcome or find solutions to the difficulties present in the piece, which I, I thought was a really good challenge to have. It, I, I figured that if I learned how to develop and resolve those problems, I would be very well equipped technically to handle other aspects of the repertoire. And so that's how that, that's how that began. Now, as far, you know, of course, this is something that I started when I was 14 years old. And so, um, you know, it's been a, an ongoing process throughout my life. <laughs> But um, with regards to Capricho Español, well, that was something that I did last year, really, and it was more of a, just simply a project that that happened in my university that they where they asked me to they asked me the very similar question. You know, is there we're we're trying to present? They told me a program of Russian music, and is there any music that you can think of for guitar that uh, that is that was written by Russian composers and I investigated a bit, and no, none of what I found was substantial enough. So, um, so I said, "Well, um, I have an idea." I said, "I can probably make an arrangement of uh, Capricho Español," and I thought that was a good way to tie the uh, Spanish heritage of the guitar to the uh, Russian, to the Russian theme of the concert. You know, um, this is you know, Capricho Español is basically the story of a Russian writing a, a Spanish-sounding piece. So. Um, so I thought it would be a uh, simple enough idea. And, of course, when I mentioned this, I had no arrangement in hand. I had only just thought of it as a potential. And so when they told me, yes, they wanted, wanted me to do it, there was a month be, it, that was a month before the concert. So I had to literally just... You know, I, I, I've done this before, you know, because of composition studies. You take the score and you basically read it. And in this case, I, uh, you know, you just take the guitar and basically look at textures in the scores and figure out how those textures could be converted into an instrument like a guitar. And so the arrangement happened that way. It took me about a month to do it. It was quite fast. But, uh, but you know, that, that's the story behind, behind Korsakov. You know, so it's different. You know, there, the difference between that one and Mussorgsky is basically a 25, you know, something like 20, 22 years of difference between one and the other. So, um, so the, the, your thought process is different and, you know, your objectives are different, you know, so. One of the things that, um, I'm always asked about with pictures and exhibition, uh, or some of the things. Uh, one one of them is very unique. It's this tremolo that you do with one finger. Now that in itself is not a, a new idea. The popular guitarists do it, and it's similar to holding a pick and and plucking it. You know, but this has a very unique aspect to it, uh, and that is that you have to also use your thumb for something else. So. In a situation like that, then there's no longer the support. 
you know, so um, you know, to work that out, you know, the the first thing is just finding uh, finding the right, I call it the the right resistance angle in the, in the nail that, that you're going to use, and so basically that means that if you're diagonal, then you can move your finger around, but you don't get you don't get that much sound out of this. I mean, it works in a general sense, but not if you're performing. So you need a better angle of resistance. So if I turn if I turn the finger to this angle, I happen to catch an edge. And in that edge I can get better projection of sound. So the difference between that and that. So that's just enough, and it has enough quality of partials uh, in it that um, that you can get the right projection. But beyond that, there's the uh, there's the other aspect of it that once you this tremolo is constantly alternating between this finger and then this one, and that is actually very unique. Uh, You know that one has uh, a, a cup, one advantage over the index finger, and that is that because it's thinner, then the angle of resistance is actually a little bit easier to find. You know, so your fin your finger can have a, a, a better curvature, and so you still have the resistance. Whereas this one, in, the, in a curvature, you still work at a diagonal, it's a much wider surface. You know, so that number one. But the disadvantage is that it's a very incapable finger. And so getting it to con being able to control this takes time. So, um, you know, so when I was working on this, that was the thing that wasn't working well. And, um, you know, so when I started asking myself, I, 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 whenever I'm trying to solve technical problems, I ask myself simple questions. And the simple question was, well, why does this one work and why does this one not work? And what does this one have that this one doesn't have? And, you know, the simple answer to that was, well, I've been playing since I was, um, you know, 10 years old. And I asked myself this question when I was 35. And so, you know, the simple, the simple answer to that was 25 years of distance between the two of them in terms of development. You know, from the time you start playing the guitar, you start using this finger, this one, and this one, and you're told not to use this one. So I figured that the process the process of approximation would require that this finger becomes more competent just playing and number one playing by itself and then interacting with other fingers. So I basically began a process of learning how to use that finger and you know we, I started with basically learning how to play it and then learning how to alternate and then using different combinations of like say free strokes or rest strokes or that kind of thing, you know. And once I started doing that, and I had a certain confidence about the finger, which was then another thing that was obvious that you know, anytime I try to use it, you know, you get tense. And the reason is because you're not really sure that you know how to use it. So once I started understanding how to use that finger, then um, it was easier to just place it. And what I wanted was gradually getting there, you know. So um, so that was the way to develop it. And then. Unfortunately, there's an, an additional element to it, and that is that eventually you have the situation where you're going here, and then you have to play play these harmonics. And now these are artificial harmonics, so you have to touch something here, then pluck here, provided the notes there, right? So, um, but of course you're doing this kind of thing. So. Um, there's no real solution for that. I mean, because in order to do this, you um, the angle of this finger would require that this finger's faced at this angle, but the harmonic requires this. You know, so um, the only way to solve that is by actually stretching out for a brief moment in time there, and then come come back to position. And so. Um, You know, so of course you're the way I'm timing this. I'm going like that. Uh, so the, there's a measure to this to the speed of this finger, and that measure is allowing me to divide the time to create the right velocity to this finger moving. So basically, it has to feel like a reflex, but I have to time the reflex according to the rhythm that this finger is providing. 
So um, that's the trick to it. And of course, if you miss time, it you miss it. You know, and that's uh, that's that's how it works. So, you know, these kinds of things, you know, uh, they're difficult. So they have a low threshold of um, predictability, meaning you're not, you know, like say in a situation like that, I'm about maybe 60 60 percent to 65 percent certain that I will not miss. You know, and so something like that is difficult to difficult to to work with, but you know. But of course, you know the, the, the chances increase if um, if the timing is right. You know, so if you have the timing properly set up, then you increase it to seventy five percent, more or less. You know, and so that that's kind of what what gives you a sense a, a better sense of security. But it is a high risk situation. You know, so you just have to just have to rely on it. You know, count on the fact that you've worked on it, and then uh, if it doesn't work, you know th- that probably means that you fell in the twenty five percent portion where you were likely to miss, you know, so, so you just hope that if you play it, if you play it 11 times, you'll get it right eight times, basically. So um, that's not a bad statistic, I think. You know, so.